shocking resilience of Russian economy. Western nations led by the United States have imposed some of the most severe economic sanctions we have seen in Russia and its president, Vladimir Putin, after he decided to declare war and invade Ukraine on February 24th of this year. This includes bans on Russian banks and exports of products, and in addition to formal sanctions, private companies have also joined in. Although the war has been ongoing for eight months, Russia's economy is still going well, and it appears that the sanctions may be hurting the European Union more than they are hurting their intended target, Russia. So what's going on? How has Russia seemingly circumvented the sanctions? Or do they still have a day of reckoning coming? Hi and welcome back to another video of Finance Sense, where we cover all the latest trends in the financial markets and the economy. This video looks at the Russian economy's resilience over the numerous sanctions it received. But before we start, make sure to hit that thumbs up, and if you're new to this channel, subscribe and turn on the notification bell to stay updated with our videos. Now, let's get on to the video. On February 24, 2022, Russian President Vladimir Putin commenced an invasion of Ukraine, prompting Western countries to impose some of the harshest economic sanctions in history on Russia. This included seizing $300 billion worth of Russian foreign currency reserves from Western central banks, banning Russian banks from the SWIFT payments network, and the export of certain technology products. Additionally, private companies have also joined in. More than 1,000 Western companies have voluntarily curtailed their operations. Western analysts and economists were fast to predict the collapse of the Russian economy, with some expecting a 12% decline in their GDP by 2022. However, a few months into the war, Russia's economy seemed to be doing just fine, and the European Union is suffering more from the sanctions. Russia saw its GDP decrease by 4% which is not great, but much less than the 12% that some analysts had predicted. The IMF has revised its full-year Russian GDP prediction from a negative 10% to a negative 6%. Meanwhile, Europe's economic situation is growing progressively worse. Inflation is predicted to reach record highs across the EU and UK as a result of reduced natural gas supplies, which are driving up costs of living. In Russia, consumer costs are declining significantly as a result of the rise in their currency. With a gain of almost 20% against the U.S. dollar, the Russian ruble has emerged as the best-performing currency of 2022. After the Moscow exchange started trading in late March, the Russian stock market has generally stabilized. As of this moment, the Russian MOEX index has decreased by 41% since the beginning of the year. However, keep in mind that the value of the currency has increased significantly. If you measure this in U.S. dollars, the Russian stock market has only fallen by 27%. This result is somewhat higher than the German stock market's 31% U.S. currency decline. Before the war, the Russian economy was doing well. Even though the pandemic prompted a recession in 2020, the country quickly recovered the following year due to increased energy exports. However, the Russian economy declined by 4% in real terms during the second quarter of 2022 as the impact of the economic sanctions became apparent. The effect of the sanctions was not distributed equally, with specific industries suffering significantly more than others. The Russian government releases a monthly report along with various economic statistics. Based on Russia's economic data, the most painful impact of the sanctions seemed to be export sanctions on high-tech products and the industry most severely impacted was automobile production which had a 62% decline. Meanwhile, cigarette manufacturing was the second most severely impacted industry. This is because two major British tobacco corporations, British American Tobacco and Imperial Brands, have decided to leave the country. Before the war, Western multinational companies employed around 12% of the Russian labor force. As these businesses shut down, many analysts projected a massive increase in the jobless rate, with rates as high as 40%. In reality, the opposite happened. Since the war began, unemployment has fallen to a near-record low of 3.9%. The vast majority of Western businesses have withdrawn, but they are simply relaunchable. It's not complicated to grow tobacco and make cigarettes. In a short period of time, Russia can increase output back to pre-war levels. Most departing Western corporations have been cheaply sold to Russian oligarchs or state-owned businesses. 
The new Russian ownership should ultimately be able to get everything back up and running, but they may need a few months to acclimate and rebrand. For instance, an oligarch purchased McDonald's 800 locations in Russia and rebranded them under a new name. All the staff members still work there, and the menu is essentially the same. In addition, H&M and other Western apparel companies have also left. The younger generations in Russia have grown to love these international brands because they consider them exotic. However, Russian brands will take the place of these Western ones. Although they might not be as fashionable, they won't make a difference. And this brings us to the things Russia would find more challenging to recreate. Manufacturing of automobiles is the first problem. The largest local automobile manufacturer in Russia is Optivaz, which produces vehicles under the Lada brand. It was formerly a joint venture between the state-owned Russian company and the French automobile giant Renault. However, Renault discontinued offering technical and supply chain assistance after the invasion of Ukraine and sold its 67 ownership for one ruble. As a result, Optivaz was forced to halt manufacturing since it could not find Western parts. In addition, Volkswagen and Toyota, two other significant global auto manufacturers, have also left the country. Also, within the first several weeks of the invasion, the ruble's value fell by 40%. This essentially increased the cost of all imported goods by 70%. So even if businesses were willing to export to Russia, prices rose to the point that more Russian consumers could no longer afford them. It should come as no surprise that this led to a sharp decline in new automobile sales, which peaked in May at 240,000. It is fair to say that the industry has completely collapsed because this constituted an 84% decrease from the previous year. However, since then, things have considerably improved. In June, Optivaz resumed the manufacture of the Lada Granto Classic. It is a pretty simple vehicle and lacks a digital infotainment system. However, it will get you from point A to point B and is incredibly cheap with a selling price of about 10,000 US dollars. By July, new car sales had marginally increased 320,000, although they were still down 75% from the same month. Chinese automobile manufacturers like Geely are gradually expanding exports to the nation as the ruble begins to recover. Chinese exporters now have a great potential to increase their market share since Western brands are shunning the country. The technology industry will be the next to suffer significantly in the Russian economy. Almost all Western semiconductor manufacturers have stopped exporting to Russia. This includes manufacturers from the United States, Europe, South Korea, and Taiwan. Every modern electronic gadget relies on semiconductors from cell phones to desktop computers. Importantly, they also utilize cutting-edge military equipment with an electronic interface such as tanks, drones, helicopters, and airplanes. Russian semiconductor companies do have the ability to design microchips, but almost all of them are produced by contract foundries in Taiwan and Europe. Currently, Russia's most advanced CPU production capacity now tops out at 90 nanometers. For CPUs, performance improves with decreasing nanometer size. In contrast, three nanometer chips can be produced by the massive Taiwanese semiconductor company, TSMC. The Albrus 401 personal computers made in Russia are powered by the domestically produced 90 nanometer chips. But it's a subpar PC with nothing else to offer but web browsing. The close trade connections between Russia and China, which has not taken part in the economic sanctions, might be a lifeline for the country's electronics industry. China has made billions of dollars in investments in its domestic semiconductor sector. Even though they are still not state-of-the-art, they can make chips for basic electronic devices and even CPUs for substandard PCs and cell phones. However, there is still one significant issue. Numerous Chinese semiconductor companies obtain software and other intellectual property licenses from U.S. companies. The U.S. now has the power to block exports to Russia. For example, the CFO of the Chinese telecom company Huawei was arrested in Canada in 2018. She is accused of breaking U.S. sanctions by reselling computer equipment produced in the U.S. to Iran. The U.S. has warned to retaliate with export sanctions against any Chinese semiconductor companies that sells to Russia with any U.S. components, and up to this point, China has complied. However, not all Chinese chips are subject to these restrictions. 
China has completely localized the value chain for some of the more basic microchips and is free to export them to Russia. In order to use these Chinese-made chips, Russian PC makers have already modified several of their motherboards. Based on the data provided by the consulting firm Merix, the second quarter of 2022 saw more than a threefold increase in Chinese semiconductor shipments to Russia. Although these chips are better than those made locally in Russia, they are five to ten years behind the Western chips that Russia once imported. You won't be able to play high-performance video games or process massive business operations on them, but they can do the majority of basic tasks. Even though Russia's electronics and automobile industries are severely strained, these industries only account for a small portion of the country's overall industrial base. Because the nation has historically imported most of these products, in July their industrial production, which has recently risen, was barely 0.5 percent lower than the previous years. Their thriving energy industry is partly responsible for the resilience of their industrial production. Shortly after the invasion, the U.S. and the U.K. banned the purchase of Russian oil, and many European businesses halted imports for personal reasons, despite not being required to. As a result, Russia began exporting this oil to willing consumers in Asian nations, particularly India and China. As of July, Russian oil output has dropped by two percent compared to pre-war levels. At first, they had to offer discounts of up to thirty-five dollars a barrel just to sell the product. However, with the equipment to process additional imports, Indian and Chinese refiners have reduced that discount to around ten percent. Also, once the oil is processed, it is nearly hard to determine where it came from. The refined goods could easily reach nations like South Korea and Japan that forbid the import of Russian crude. India and China benefit significantly from this since they can purchase Russian oil at a discounted price. Interestingly, Saudi Arabia has doubled its purchases of Russian oil. The largest oil exporter in the world is Saudi Arabia. So why would they import oil from Russia? They are purchasing discounted Russian oil to be used for their own domestic consumption. As a result, they have more of their own products available for sale in Europe, where they can sell them at a higher price. In addition, more money is pouring into Russia than leaving due to high oil costs and Western export restrictions. From January through July, the nation's current account surplus was $167 billion, which is triple compared to the same period last year. The majority of revenues have been earned by state-owned energy companies, thus boosting the Kremlin's coffers. Now that he has a large war chest, Putin can support high-tech companies to compete with Western imports. The Russian government just allocated forty billion dollars to expand local semiconductor production, and they want to produce entirely domestic twenty-eight nanometer CPUs by 2030. However, even if Russia reaches its goal, They will still be 20 years behind as TSMC began manufacturing chips using a 28 nm manufacturing process in 2011. Russia is developing into a nation that is rich in cash but lacking in technology. It will take them many years to catch up to where the West is now in terms of semiconductors and other high-tech businesses. They can still import finished consumer gadgets like cell phones and personal computers, so this does not imply that they will return to the Stone Age. The ruble will continue to be strong, and ordinary Russian citizens can easily purchase gadgets from China as long as oil and natural gas prices remain high. Thanks for making it to the end of this video. If you enjoyed it, please hit like and subscribe, as it would help us extend our reach to many audiences. Also, make sure to leave your thoughts in the comments section down below. This is Finance Sense, helping you keep up with all the latest trends in the financial markets and the economy. See you in the next video.